Hello, my name is Keith Boston and this is News Voice. And in a little moment, we're going to be talking to a man who believes we, humanity, are destroying the planet we live on. And we're doing it in the name of consumerism. We'll talk to him in just a second. Let me just remind you that News Voice is an app that uh, seeks to break free uh, from the constraints of corporate media. And we make news more democratic, and more open and more transparent. I'll tell you more about that after the interview. All right, George Monbeau is a man who writes for TheGuardian.com. He also uh, writes books, and he often writes about the environment, the world we live in, uh, the wildlife we share the planet with, and how we're destroying all that via our belief and habitual use of consumerism, products. You may have seen uh, stories about the amount of plastics that's been found in the world's oceans recently. And that's simply because, according to George, we just can't stop using things and buying things, even uh, single-use plastics. Uh, he's written several books, uh, such as Bring on the Apocalypse, Heat, How to Stop the Planet Burning, and Feral, uh, Searching for Enchantment on the Frontiers of Rewilding, Bringing Back Wildlife to Our Countries. And uh, on his website, George makes a list of all those things he fights against. And let me take you through the list. It's a long one. Uh, here they are. Environmental destruction, undemocratic power, corruption, deception of the public, injustice, inequality, and the misallocation of resources, waste, denial, libertarianism, which grants freedom to the powerful at the expense of the powerless, undisclosed interests, and complacency. Doesn't sound very complacent. And so I asked George there, how does he manage to take any time free from that long list of things to do? What does he do on his one day off a year? <laughs> well, um, I, I work very hard in the hours that I do work. And the rest of the time, I'm actually pretty good at switching off. I've got a lot of hobbies, get outdoors as much as I can. Um, I find it's essential not to live and breathe it in every waking moment. Otherwise, you'll just burn out, especially when you're up against such massive forces and they often seem almost insuperable. You just have to look after yourself while you're doing so. I always feel that using the word the environment is, is very inadequate because everybody's got their own idea of what that means. Either it's the ice flow melting or, or fracking or... Um, uh, or diesel cars or something, but, but how do you focus when you talk, because a lot of your energy goes into the, to the, what we'd call the environment. First to say, uh, I guess I think the environment is a terrible term. <laughs> it creates no pictures in the mind at all. Um, it's one of those many alienating terms we use, which makes it much harder to engage people's attention with, with the issues. So I prefer to talk about the natural world or the living planet or wildlife ecosystems, um, things which create pictures in people's minds. So, um, yeah, there's obviously we're um, facing environmental crisis on just about all fronts and the living world coming under massive pressure um, happening right in front of our eyes. Um, we've seen a threefold increase in humanity's use of resources in the past 40 years. This is totally impossible to sustain mm. and already the cost is being borne by all the other species that we share the planet with mm. it's being driven by consumption it's as simple as that we've got um, a, a commitment to endless growth on a planet that isn't growing and the result is that we dig deeper and deeper into that planet remove more of its minerals and timber and fish and soil and all the other things that keep us alive, fresh water, uh, clean air, the rest of it. Um, and we are facing a crisis now on multiple fronts because it's not being properly engaged with. And you're quite right in the media. Um, it's almost as if this is a discussion we cannot have. It's counter aspirational. It runs against the whole thrust of consumerism which the media by and large exists to support i often wonder when when i read articles like the ones you write why aren't people seeing this is it because we have some is it a blind spot or is it because it doesn't fit in with the consumerist society that uh, you talk about 
we're being encouraged not to see it. Um, you turn on the radio, you turn on the television, and what's going on is a determined effort to stop us from thinking about anything. The primary bias within the media is the bias against relevance. You know, we can say, oh, they're biased towards the right, they're biased towards the left. Actually, the big bias is towards the stuff that really counts, or rather against the stuff that really counts. What's important is not salient in the media. What is salient in the media is not important. Um, but it's also um, the, the, the case that all the framing, all the values that are triggered are the exact opposite of the ones that we need to engage if we're going to sort out our problems. So, and uh, I guess it's compounded by the fact, um, and maybe this really sits at the root of it all, is that the prevailing ideology of our times, which is so prevalent that we don't even see it because it's the plastic soup in which we swim, is consumerism. Mm. And children are brought up from the first stirrings of consciousness to um, believe that their well-being depends on having more and more stuff and having shoes like the shoes that um, my friend has got or um, a, 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 another teddy bear this week because I haven't had one this week. And, and just this sense that life must involve the ever greater accumulation of things that we don't need. We are imbued with that from the very beginning. So we require a massive effort to fight it, but far from assisting that effort, the media is primarily a consumerist institution, mm. which because it depends on advertising revenue, because it's owned by people who make their money from selling us stuff we don't need, um, constantly induces us to buy to buy to buy i would guess that a lot of people would uh, say okay what's the alternative uh, george do we have to go back to living like the american native americans and, and live close to nature in tents well we have to live simply but living simply is very complicated because you find yourself up against the entire system when you try to do so and while it's no longer necessary in most cases to do what um, they did in Brave New World, which was to massacre the simple lifers with machine gun fire, because the simple lifers tend to be completely marginalized anyway mm. and have almost no voice in public life. Um, uh, we are just you know, up against the entire system in trying to live without destroying the living planet. So what's required is a complete rethink. And obviously there are some brilliant people out there who are doing this complete rethink. And I you know, hope I've been contributing to it myself, where we look at how we can live within the, the planetary boundaries, within um, the constraints of knowing that there's only a limited amount to go round. And if we exceed that amount, we destroy the rest of the living world as well as our own future prospects. Mm. Um, and that requires a completely different worldview. So, you know, what I've been trying to do really throughout my books and articles and the rest of it is to try to formulate that completely different worldview. But it is a constant struggle. You know, there's endless space in the newspapers and in the broadcasters, but none of it is made available to discussions like this one. Does that make you angry or does that make you, uh, fill you with despair? It makes me bloody angry, yes. Yes, it really makes me angry. I, I don't despair though, despair, I think um, the Christians got it right. Despair is a sin. Uh -huh. Despair is, is um, um, prevents you from acting. It gives you an excuse not to act, in fact. I find people using this uh, as a very effective excuse. It was, it's been fascinating watching the whole climate breakdown discussions. And incidentally, I call it climate breakdown because calling it climate change is like calling a f an invading army unexpected visitors. It's such a ridiculously <laughs> neutral term for this existential crisis that we face. Um, where, you know, you go back a few years and very large numbers of people were denying that um, um, it was happening at all taking their cue from the fossil fuel industry. 
And then they went from that state of denial straight into a state saying, okay, yes, it is happening, but it's too late to do anything about it. Mm. And there's no intermediate stage of saying, um, it's happening, and so therefore we ought to act. And what you find is that despair is just another form of denial. It's just another way of saying, oh, well, let's not bother then. Let's carry on driving our enormous gas guzzlers. Let's carry on flying off to Bratislava for a stag party and Thailand for our holidays and the rest of it because there's no point in even trying. So it's as if the issue doesn't exist. Mm. It's just another way of denying it. But the, the radical approach and the necessary approach is to say, yes, it's real. Here is a realistic program for dealing with it. Um, I wrote a book called Heat in 2006, which laid out exactly what that program should be. And here are the policies and the politics we require to implement that program. Pro probably the three most important things would be, number one, leave fossil fuels in the ground. Simply stop extracting fossil fuels. And if we stop extracting fossil fuels, well, that forces us to do lots of innovative and exciting things in terms of creating a new economy which mm. doesn't depend on, on the burning of fossil fuels. Um, and it makes us think much harder about how we're going to uh, run that economy without endless growth, which is what fossil fuels made possible. Um, the um, next thing I would say is um, a radical shift in the way that we eat, because huge amounts of environmental destruction, I mean, the major cause of uh, the destruction of wildlife and ecosystems is the farming and the fishing industries. It can be massively reduced, and the principal reduction is a switch to a plant-based diet. Meat and fish is trashing the planet at the moment. Um, I think the third one would be change our economics so that the aim of economics is not endless growth, but human well-being in in harmony with the well-being of the rest of the living world. And that's one thing I did want to talk to you about, and that was... Um, we, we view things always uh, in a, a human-based prism. Um, if there's a, a natural disaster, we talk about the, the, the human uh, victims of that disaster, but never mention the fact that maybe lots of wildlife has been wiped out in that fire or in that flood. Um, you do write about this aspect of the, the environment, the natural world, wildlife, and how we should pay more attention to that. And, and I'd, is, there a, is there a place for... Animal rights, we talk so much about human rights. Should we be talking about animal rights? Yeah, we definitely should. And, you know, it's not just about us. We share this planet with millions of magnificent, fascinating, extraordinary species, um, all of which are just as evolved as we are, um, just as remarkable as we are in their own ways, doing their own things. And there's this, uh, I suppose it's another of our hidden ideologies, isn't it? Which says that it all revolves around us. It's all about our well-being and our welfare and everything else must make way for that. Mm. Um, and so I feel we need a far broader view, which um, can be summarized in the phrase, the more than human world, which I think is a really good way of framing this, which says, yes, we're important. Of course we can. And of course we have to aim for a world in which everybody is well treated, everybody has, has a decent level of well-being, but at the same time we recognise that that principle should extend to the other life forms alongside which we live. Hmm. And so I'm very much in favour of this um, nature needs half movement, which says let's make sure that half the land and sea on this planet are, um, are, are set aside from human impacts. Um, and you know, it's not even very generous, is it? When you consider we're just one of millions of species and we say, well, we're going to have 50% mm. and all the other millions will share the rest of the 50%. But it can be done. Um, and, and that does require that shift in diet, though, because um, it's meat eating and fishing, which mobilizes so much of the, the, the world's surface in order to feed us and requires the almost complete environmental destruction of that world surface um, to keep feeding this appetite for more and more meat and flesh and fish. That was George Monbeau, and thanks to him for uh, talking to us. You can read his columns and writings in The Guardian, guardian.com. 
If you want to find out more about his books and his other projects, then go to his website, which is monbio.com. It's about like this. Uh, if you'd like to suggest somebody you'd like us to interview here at News Voice, then please do so. Uh, drop me a line at this address, Keith dot Keith at newsvoice.com. I don't know my own address. And uh, we'll try and fix that. News Voice is an app that tries to make news more democratic, more open, and more transparent. If you uh, download the News Voice app, as well as reading the news and seeing all the sources news stories are taken from, uh, whether they're on the left or the right or somewhere in the middle, uh, you can also submit stories yourself. You can write headlines and summaries yourself. You can upvote stories and comments that you think are particularly insightful. So uh, go to your app store and download News Voice or look it up on the uh, internet and uh, I'm sure you'll like it. I did. I'm Keith Foster. Thanks for being with us today. I'll see you again soon. Bye.